welcome to the 2018 Embankment Dams and Slopes Web Conference. Thanks for joining us, and we have four excellent presentations today. Each presentation will last about 22 minutes, and there will be three to four minutes for questions that you can submit. Before introducing our speakers, I'd like to introduce our two sponsors for today's event. The first is Keller. The connected companies of Keller in North America are uniquely positioned to handle the most complex geotechnical construction projects nationwide. By including all services in one contract, Keller reduces client risk and ensures all aspects of a project are met on time and on budget. And we appreciate Keller's sponsorship. Also, I'd like to acknowledge the sponsorship of Rock Science. Rock Science is a world leader in developing 2D and 3D software for civil, mining, and geotechnical engineers. For over 20 years, Rock Science has been at the leading edge of research to build geotechnical tools that are used by over 7,000 engineers around the world for slope stability, excavation design, and geotechnical analyses. We appreciate the support of both Keller and Rock Science. The speakers today, uh, first is Gada Alisi, who will discuss Louisville Dam. Next is Daniel Perdell, who will discuss the La Conchita landslide in 2005. Vinod Tawari will be third, and he will discuss the, the performance of a structure during the magnitude 7.8 Nepal earthquake. And I'll end with a presentation on an MSC wall failure and some of the lessons learned from that failure. So I'd like to introduce our first speaker. There you go. Our first speaker is Dada Alithi. She is a senior research civil engineer in the Geotechnical and Structures Laboratory at the Engineering Research and Development Center in Vicksburg, Mississippi. Gada has been working for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers for the last six years and is also an adjunct professor at Mississippi State University. Gada, thanks for joining us and discussing the upstream slope failure in Louisville Dam stability analyses and lessons learned. Sure, uh, thank you, Tim. Um, hello, everyone, good afternoon. Um, so uh, uh, as Tim mentioned, my name is Gada Lethe. I work at ERDIC, uh, Engineer Research and Development Center in Vicksburg, Mississippi with the Army Corps of Engineers. And uh, I will be presenting uh, today a case history and lessons learned from uh, the upstream slope failure in Louisville Dam that occurred in 2015. And before I start, I would like to acknowledge and thank my co-authors, uh, Ms. Anita Branch. Uh, she works at the Fort Worth uh, District, um, and also uh, Dr. Uh, Tim Stark uh, at University of Illinois. Um, so as an outline of the presentation, first I'm going to go through uh, just a brief introduction on the purpose of running the analyses uh, for on, on, the, on this uh, slide, um, and as well as some in, um, information uh, on the Louisville Dam, its construction and embankment material, um, and some specifics about the failure of the upstream slope. Uh, then uh, I will discuss the results from uh, laboratory tests that were conducted on uh, samples uh, retrieved from uh, the failure plane, um, and then go over the model uh, analyses uh, that were performed for this investigation, results and discussion, and then conclusions um, and lesson learned. So uh, the mechanics in, in, of transient seepage have been uh, well understood for uh, and developed for, ne for nearly three decades. Uh, numerical models, both 2D and 3D, 
uh, have been developed um, as well and can and can model the transient seepage, including uh, some phenomenon, um, example, the hysteresis due to the uh, the air and water uh, and phase dynamics. Uh, also, a phenomenon of the uh, compressibility of the porous matrix. However, uh, practicing engineers uh, tend to have less trust in the results of such numerical uh, transit solutions, and that's due to the lack of full-scale validation of the results of uh, transit seepage, seepage analysis uh, run on embankment and dams, uh, embankment dams and levees. And uh, furthermore, uh, the geotechnical practice typically uh, decouples the seepage modeling from stability modeling. And um, uh, of you who are geotechnical engineers, you, you may know uh, that the uh, seepage and soil mechanics are coupled processes uh, because when pore, pr pore pressures are changed, uh, the influence, the strength, and deformation of the soil matrix. And this, in turn, influenced the pore pressures due to volumetric changes in the soil structure. So definitely the seepage and the soil mechanics or the, the volumetric change uh, changes in the soil matrix is, is a fully coupled, um, is a fully coupled uh, processes. Um, and therefore, fully coupled numerical solutions must be developed to at least quantify the error associated with the decoupled solutions. Um, this will bring me to uh, to talk about the uh, the lowest fill dam and the up, upstream uh, slope failure, which uh, we're investigating in this study. So as a, a brief introduction on Louisville Dam, it, it is located in Louisville, Texas, um, and it has been constructed over a period of six years from 1949 to 1954, util, utilizing multiple contracts. And between each contract, um, each slope, the end of the, uh, the embankment was sloped at uh, 10 horizontals to one vertical. Um, the height of the height of the uh, the embankment is 50 meters or 50 feet, um, with a length of 10 kilometers or 6.2 miles. Uh, the crest elevation uh, is 560 feet. Um, the upstream and the downstream slopes are um, three horizontal to one vertical and two and a half horizontal to one vertical. Um, the embankment uh, of the of the dam is an impervious homogeneous structure and it was built using imper impervious materials that were obtained from um, on-site borrow areas uh, and excavations. Um, also incorporated into the design of the dam is a, a three foot thick uh, drainage blanket uh, underneath the downstream uh, section of the embankment. Um, the, the dam, uh, the entire embankment of the Louisville Dam is founded on overburdened soils. Um, so there is the residual soils uh, that are from the upland areas in the vicinity of the site. Uh, the soils uh, to the uh, to the east of the embankment uh, to the east of the dam uh, are in the Stewart's Creek floodplain, and they are predominantly uh, clay uh, residuum from the Eagle Ford Shale. Um, and uh, to the west is the Elm Fork uh, floodplain, and it's mainly sandy soils of the Woodbine Group. Uh, so that's the foundation of of the embankment dam. So regarding the slide, on, um, on June 23rd, 2015, uh, after heavy rainfall season, following near, nearly a historic uh, drought uh, that lasted for five years of uh, extreme drought with no uh, rain, um, and then 
it was observed that a deep-seated slide occurred in the upstream slope between stations 182 and 184. Um, the scarp of the the scarp of the slide uh, was about 16 feet deep, um, and the toe of the slide was surveyed afterwards, and it was found to be found found to be near elevation 526 feet, which is about uh, 34 feet below the crest of the embankment, and eight feet below the reservoir elevation at the time of the slide. And you can see in the picture here, just to, to give you a perspective of the slide, um, and uh, just to scale, uh, those people are standing on top of the slide there in the, in the picture. Um, it's also worth noting that there is an adjacent area to the slide uh, that uh, slid uh, back in 1995, and that was re uh, repaired, uh, but it, it, this area was not affected by the 2015 slide. Um, and then uh, the analyses that were conducted uh, were run uh, for a period of time of 173 days. Uh, starting from January 1st, 2015, until June 23rd, 2015, when the slide occurred. Uh, there isn't really um, a specific reason for why the January 1st um, was selected date, but uh, as you can see from the hydrograph, uh, which is the orange dot, uh, orange dot, the hydrograph of the reservoir that the uh, reservoir elevation maintained uh, almost a constant uh, elevation at uh, elevation 514 uh, for uh, several or few months before it started to pick up and leading to the failure in, in June on June 23rd. Uh, the blue dots are actually uh, the rainfall or the precipitation that were collected from uh, NOAA or the Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Um, uh, records uh, for the uh, Louisville weather station. Uh, and reservoir water levels were obtained from the dam operation records. Um, and you can see, uh, as you can see in the, the graph or the plot uh, on this slide. Um, so after uh, the slide occurred, uh, within a couple of uh, weeks, uh, it, it was surveyed and it was uh, investigated, and then uh, there was a requirement uh, to uh, collect samples uh, from the slide plane and uh, test it to get uh, the uh, index properties as well as strength properties of the material on the slide plane. Uh, so. Um, there were five block uh, cubicle samples, uh, each measuring uh, 12 inch by 12 inch by 12 inch, that were collected from the exposed slide surface at locations that were selected by the geotechnical engineer who was um, in charge of, of investigation of the slide. And the samples were uh, excavated using hand tools and were taken uh, perpendicular to the slide plane. Um, along one particular uh, line uh, within the uh, the middle uh, or the mid point of, of the slide. Uh, the lab tests were performed on all the five samples, uh, included Atterberg limits, a hydrometer, natural moisture content, um, a fully softened direct shear, as well as uh, consolidated undrained tractal. And on the slide that you can see in front of you, so uh, for example, for the CU tests that were done on undisturbed samples, so as uh, you can see on, on the pictures, uh, Shelby tubes were pushed uh, into the cube block test to retrieve the undisturbed uh, sample on which the CU tracks of tests were uh, performed on. Um, and the slide shows the average um, of the, the results of these tests. Um, I just want to uh, note that 
Um, uh, you see that the liquid limit is 78 percent. Actually, it's the plastic uh, index or plasticity index. PI is 50 percent, not the plastic limit. So that's just a typo. I, I wanted to uh, make note of that. Um, and so the plastic limit actually was 28 percent, which is on average, which is very close to the natural moisture content uh, that was uh, measured uh, on these samples. And um, for the fully softened um, direct shear test, uh, the, uh, the C, the cohesion, was uh, the, on the five samples ranged from 7.7 .7 kilopascals to 11.5 kilopascals with an average of 8.6. And the uh, fully softened friction angle uh, ranged between 17 to 19.5 degrees with an average of 18 degrees. Um, and it's uh, worth mentioning here, and uh, you will see it in the in, in uh, upcoming slide, uh, that the, uh, for, for the analyses, uh, for the slope stability analyses, a friction angle of 16 degrees uh, was used, which is uh, somehow very close to the fully softened uh, friction angle that was uh, tested or uh, resulted from the direct shear test. Uh, so to evaluate the initial port pressures um, distribution in the embankment, uh, first, a steady state seepage analysis was performed using a CW uh, package, which is uh, um, a module from the GeoSlope uh, or GeoStudio, uh, at a reservoir water level elevation of 514. And if you recall from the hydro hydrograph, this is the water elevation at which uh, it was constant at the reservoir for a few months before it started to increase. And it was observed uh, that the steady state, um, and, and then after that, after the steady state uh, seepage uh, analysis was performed, then it was used as a parent analysis for transient seepage and fully coupled analyses uh, using CW for the transient seepage and for sigma W for the fully coupled analysis. Uh, so basically, you start with a steady state uh, analysis to initiate the, or to, um, to determine the uh, initial pore pressure distribution within the embankment. And from that, uh, different approaches were uh, taken to determine the uh, pore water pressure distributions, whether it's using uh, another, another steady state or transient uh, seepage analysis or fully coupled analysis. And after the poor water pressure distribution has been established, then it, it, it was followed by a limit equilibrium slope stability analysis to determine the uh, factor of safety uh, against um, uh, slope instability. Uh, using the slope W and um, for for the slope for the slope stability, uh, it was conducted using Spencer method on a fully defined slide surface, which was confirmed by the survey uh, performed after the surface uh, on the surface of, uh, after the slide was exposed. So we have a predefined uh, or predetermined uh, slide surface. Uh, which uh, was confirmed by the survey and which the uh, slope stability uh, analysis was conducted uh, on. So in the next slides, uh, we're going to show, uh, I will show you. So this is, uh, this slide shows here the, the GeoStudio uh, model with the embankment in a reddish material uh, and the foundation in uh, the green material. Um, and this table summarizes the summarizes the uh, strength as well as the hydraulic properties of of the uh, of the embankment material. Uh, we also used uh, un, unsaturated uh, shear strength uh, in uh, when in some of the cases when conducting the slope uh, slope stability. 
Um, and one of the aspects is the desiccation cracking. Uh, so the desiccation cracking um, uh, using uh, this equation that is presented on, on the slide from uh, Lou and uh, Lico, uh, 2004. And this is uh, using the SWC curve, the soil water characteristic curve uh, parameters uh, to estimate the, uh, the cracked zone, uh, which is just the difference between uh, the, the difference between the depth to the uh, water elevation and the depth of uh, the point where uh, K note or the um, the at rest uh, the at rest coefficient of earth pressure becomes zero. Um, Uh, we also used in the analysis different boundary conditions, uh, including uh, mechanical and hydraulic boundary conditions. Uh, uh, one of the boundary conditions is the precipitation. Um, however, um, it was shown from, from the results that the distribution of the pore water pressures uh, due to the precipitation was insignificant, maybe 1 to 2 percent. Uh, and this result is anticipated when considering uh, the, the low hydraulic conductivity nature of the CH material of the embankment. Um, however, if, if, we ha if there are uh, more previous embankment materials, maybe the effect of precipitation would be uh, more obvious. Um, so when we when we ran a steady state uh, seepage for the reservoir at elevation 534, which was the elevation of the reservoir at the time of the slide, uh, that resulted in a factor of safety of 0.91, and that's that's definitely conservative, even without uh, the use of a desiccation crack. Uh, so the steady state, as as we know, it tends to uh, produce conservative values of pore water pressures and hence conservative values for the uh, for this uh, slope stability factor of safety. Um, on the other hand, um, the other side, when considering transient seepage and suction increased shear strength uh, without the consideration of coupled effect or desiccation cracks, uh, that resulted in an unconservative factor of safety of 1.62. Um, the following slide uh, shows the results, the factor of safety equals to unity uh, when considering seepage analysis followed by uh, and desiccation cracking uh, soil suction and followed by a fully coupled analysis that takes into consideration the changes in the, uh, volume, the volumetric changes and the, the stiffness of the embankment material. So this uh, analysis uh, resulted in a factor of safety equals to one or unity. Uh, this slide here uh, presents comparison of the different uh, factor of safeties resulted from different analyses um, and the boundary conditions that were considered, uh, not the boundary conditions, but I'll say the, the, the cases uh, or the uh, conditions that were considered during, uh, uh, during the analysis. Uh, so for the steady state, as I mentioned, it produced a 0.91, which is a co uh, conservative factor of safety. Um, um, with the precipitation, uh, when considering uh, the soil suction, of course, the factor of safety increased to 1.2. Um, and then if we look at the coupled analysis, when, uh, when all the conditions were considered uh, properly, uh, it produced a factor of safety of unity, which indicate an eminent uh, slide, which is a good represent, um, an accurate uh, representation of what actually happened. So the desiccation cracking uh, was developed um, and considered. The precipitation was also considered, as well as the soil suction uh, or the increase in the strength due to soil suction was considered, and with fully coupled analysis, a uh, factor of safety of one uh, was uh, resulted or resulted in from from the analysis. Um, as a summary, uh, the upstream fa uh, slope failure of Louisville Dam uh, that happened in, on June. 
23, 2015, was investigated. Um, and that happened after a heavy uh, rainfall event uh, after following a 4.5 or 5 years of record uh, drought. Uh, a fully softened strand developed during the service life, so that uh, should be uh, considered uh, for future uh, design or future uh, analysis. Uh, the effect of stress, the slope stability analyses have been performed uh, using poor water pressures generated from different approaches. Um, and when the steady state by itself was uh, used, then resulted in conservative value of 0.91. But it, it should be noted that for such a, a material that is a CH material, it's highly unlikely that a fully or a steady state condition will develop in such a short period of time. Uh, transient seepage analysis accounted for precipitation and suction yield uh, a close or a close factor safety of 1.01, but yet when a fully coupled analysis accounted for precipitation, suction, and desiccation cracking, it yielded a factor safety of 1.0. Uh, um, because with a fully coupled analysis, then uh, the poor, poor water pressures are increased, resulting in a slightly lower factor of safety. So a fully coupled analysis considered uh, poor water pressure generated from seepage, uh, changes in toll stresses, and transit uh, hydraulic boundary conditions, which is uh, recommended for um, an accurate investigation of a failure or even for a design, um, if um, you know, just to check on on the accuracy of the factor of safety. Uh, with that, I end my presentation. And if you have any questions, I think I need to go to the questions and answers. Um, I don't see any questions posted so far. Right. <clears throat> okay. All right, thank you, Gata, for uh, starting our web conference. Sure. Okay, our next, next speaker is Daniel Perdell. Daniel Perdell is the professor of practice at the Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio. Prior to joining the Ohio State University faculty, Daniel spent uh, almost 30 years working in geotechnical practice in Southern California, including owning his own firm in the LA area. Daniel's presentation is titled, Progressive Failure Reactivation of the La Conchita Landslide in 2005. Daniel, thanks for joining us, and your slides are ready. Daniel, are you on the line? Hello? Yes, uh, I'm here. Okay. All right. Um, uh, uh, sorry, I was disconnected. Uh, did you introduce me already, Tim? Yes, we oh, already. Okay. Yes. All right. So um, I investigated La Conchita uh, starting in 1995, and uh, La Conchita is located uh, about two hours north of uh, Los Angeles along the coast and about uh, 20 minutes south of Santa Barbara. And in this presentation, uh, I'll be using some references, and if you want to know more about the references or, or the investigation that that, that we performed, uh, please go to the 2014 uh, paper published at the ASC Geo Congress in Atlanta. The uh, La Conchita landslide occurred on a steep slope about 30 degrees, uh, a little bit more than 500 feet in height, that is located uh, between the ocean uh, and uh, a mesa where La Conchita Ranch st st is, uh, is located. Uh, there was a wall, it's hard to see in this picture, uh, that was built around 2000, and uh, it resulted in the death of the 10 people and uh, the uh, destruction or damage of 36 homes. 
the landslide in 2005 was famous because it was captured on video, but also uh, because uh, the witnesses saw the landslide, uh, uh, many witnesses saw the landslide as it took place. One thing that uh, was reported really early on is that the failure started at a tow, and uh, the uh, newscast or the television crews indicated that the retaining wall at the base that we saw in the previous slide uh, was the first thing to fail. A little bit about the geotechnical and geologic setting of La Conchita is that uh, we have a mesa that has been uplifted tectonically, so there are marine sediments. Uh, and uh, this is one of the, 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 uh, uh, the fastest tectonic uplifts in the world, it compares to the Himalayas. So the rocks are poorly cemented, being marine uh, base, and also through the middle of the slope uh, is the Red Mountain Fault, which crosses the slope diagonally, roughly where the ranch road is shown in this picture. And what it means is that we have very weak fracture materials that compose the slope. This slope has had a long history of landsliding. Uh, historic landslides occurred in 1865, 1889, 1909. The 1909 landslide is particularly well known because it buried a train which resulted in the relocation of the train tracks. Uh, then uh, 1937, 1995, which also was partly captured on video, uh, that involved a 1.3 million cubic yards, destroyed nine homes, and buried uh, the street that was located at the toe of the slope, uh, but did not uh, uh, result in any fatalities. And of course, the famous 2005 landslide, uh, which was, for all purposes, uh, moved like a debris flow and that destroyed uh, many homes and killed 10 people. A little bit about the history of this landslide. Uh, we see a recent movement starting in 1988. Uh, in this 1989 photograph, you may see that uh, uh, that area did not, devoted, did, without any vegetation. Uh, and uh, uh, these uh, failure, uh, which was small compared to the 1995 failure, uh, was captured by numerous people in photographs. In this area, in 1994, uh, we had accelerated movement. Uh, here is a picture taken, and you can see the offset on the road, uh, you know, right next to the 1988 failure. And uh, when the next rainy season started, uh, the 1.3 million cubic yard of landslide that became the March 1995 uh, landslide took place. And this once destroyed many homes along the toe of the slope uh, where uh, along the edge of the town of La Conchita. A little bit about the conditions uh, uh, immediately after the 95 failure. Uh, the uh, drainage, of course, was altered by the failure. And I've drawn here in blue the, the, um, uh, the uh, arrows showing how water would typically flow. Most of the water falling on the landslide will go towards uh, the right side of the landslide in this photograph. Uh, also, water coming from the ranch road and the slope above uh, would penetrate or would enter through the middle of the landslide. And a depression was formed, which local people called Anderson Lake, where water would pond uh, in roughly the lower one-third of the slope or the landslide. So uh, with these conditions, uh, certain mitigation measures, and I put that on the code marks, uh, were taken. The first one was the mitigation measures taken by the ranch. The ranch uh, consultants came up with a winterization plan. Uh, here you have it in this slide, which involved very, very minor volumes of grading. Uh, you may see there that all the numbers are uh, uh, two to nine cubic yards, uh, seven, uh, uh, seven cubic yards here, 33 cubic yards of excavation, 33 cubic yards of fill. So very, very minor amounts 
of, of grading involve. Their consultants for the ranch decided to allow water to actually flow through the landslide and actually cross in the lower portion through the middle of the landslide. In this photograph here, you see roughly the location of the property line uh, between the ranch and the individual homeowners at the toe of the slope. <clears throat> the winterization involved creating a sort of a gutter drain that intercepted water just below the ranch road and that directed water to, uh, uh, to the area that's shown here as a pond. Uh, a berm was also created along the edge of the pond and essentially water uh, flowed through the middle of the slide in the lower portion of the slide. This condition led to, uh, of course, increased infiltration from the pond and the channel. Uh, since the slide debris are uh, uh, more permeable than uh, the underlying bedrock, there was a tendency for water not only to penetrate in the area of the pond and channel, but also to flow downslope within the slide debris mass. Another set of uh, measures was taken by the County of Ventura. Uh, the County of Ventura asked FEMA for money to actually reopen the street that you see in this picture here, uh, buried at the toe of the hill. <clears throat> and uh, the FEMA provided funds to actually build a soldier beam and lagging wall. And this wall was built around 2000. <clears throat> and uh, here you see some pictures taken during construction. Uh, the wall was not built with any sort of gravel drain behind. Also, between the boards, no spacers or loops were placed to allow water to uh, escape uh, in between uh, the lagging, uh, the, the pieces of lagging. And uh, as a result, uh, this wall began to act essentially like a dam. In this aerial photograph shown in 2004, you can actually see some stains high up uh, on the wall. And uh, the following picture, which I took uh, in 2004, about a year before the failure, uh, shows you that those water stains go up uh, in the order of 12 to 14 feet uh, above the road. Uh, you have a car there for scale. <clears throat> Uh, homeowners regularly saw uh, uh, water flowing through the wall, uh, sometimes like small jets of water, as you can see here in this picture. And uh, even after the failure, uh, many of the areas where water uh, seepage was uh, occurring could be seen through, uh, uh, through, through areas of the wall. In terms of design, the consultants designed these lagging and soldier pile wall as an active pressure wall. And uh, um, uh, an active pressure assumes that the wall can move away from the soil, and this obviously does not occur at the toe of a landslide. How did this happen? Well, there were objections uh, by the different reviewers working for the county. Uh, the first reviewer asked uh, questions whether the wall should be considered temporary. You may see the first question here. How can this wall be considered temporary if there's a time frame that will ensure the removal of the wall? Otherwise, the wall should be designed as a permanent structure. They had issues dealing with the earth pressures, the use of active earth pressures. There was issues dealing with uh, the buildup of groundwater, uh, that the wall may actually alter certain natural surface drainage. The uh, uh, first reviewers also had issues with debris flows, whether they were considered, whether the wall uh, uh, would uh, uh, create uh, a, debris, a diversion of debris flows. And what ended up happening is that the reviewers were replaced uh, by the county, uh, and a second set of reviewers uh, looked, asked, 
many of the same questions as the first reviewer, but uh, uh, they uh, they uh, bowed to uh, the county who, as you can see in the review comments at the bottom of this page, uh, the county has stipulated that the design intent of the proposed retaining wall was to open the street on the temporarily, the, 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 temporarily and so uh, the wall was approved and built. A few months before the 2005 landslide took place, uh, uh, this aerial photograph uh, was taken, and uh, uh, between 2000 and 2004, as you can see in the, uh, this chart that shows annual rainfall below, we had well below uh, average rainfall in the area, which resulted in the areas outside of the landslide in the slopes being very dry. But if you look at the limits in yellow of the 2005 failure, uh, the area has uh, heavy and very green vegetation, indicating that water was obviously accumulating in the landslide mass. Uh, the next picture, which, in, which is an oblique photograph, the same one that we saw a moment ago for the wall, uh, you can see very, very clearly in the area between the pond and uh, the County of Ventura wall uh, that has those water strains, you know, the area having obviously lush green vegetation, indicating an accumulation of wall water, water penetrating from the pond, but also water being dammed uh, by the wall below. Let's talk a little bit about the day of the failure in 2005. Uh, there were uh, lots of witnesses that provided different types of information. Uh, one of the residents noted that uh, the frightening sounds were emanating from the wall. Uh, there was uh, mud that started accumulating on Vista, Vista del Rincón about two and a half hours before the failure. But minutes before the debris flow, uh, the uh, local television crew drove along the Vista del Rincón and reported that the wall was severely tilted in areas and uh, reported a range of angles between 8 and 20 degrees. <clears throat> These um, um, television crew uh, people were later deposed and they drew uh, these diagrams showing how much they remember the wall being uh, rotated. So the debris flow took place. In this aerial photograph here, you see where the wall is located. Part of it cannot be seen because it's buried by the debris. But very importantly, uh, um, the, uh, the debris flow actually switched directions. It came directly towards the wall and then turned uh, as it was going down towards the left. This buried Damage destroyed many homes, and here is you have uh, one of those locations, and you can actually see some of the some of the steel I beams from the wall uh, in the background. This aerial photograph here shows a little bit better the path of the flow and uh, the diversion towards the left as the landslide was coming down. Another thing that, that, that I want to point in this photograph is the bulge that was created by soil immediately above the wall. So, so we'll come to that bulge in a second. Uh, we did a subsurface investigation, took samples, uh, found a peak strength, residual strength, and, and, and so on and so forth and uh, uh, came up with, uh, for flak modeling, with the strength that you see here. If you want to have more information about the testing, please read the 2014 uh, paper uh, on La Conchita uh, that we wrote. <clears throat> so what was the mechanism, uh, uh, the critical mode of failure that was predicted when we put in the strength uh, in our slope stability model or our flak model, uh, it was that uh, with high groundwater table, water damming behind the wall and penetrating uh, from the pond, that the lower portion will fail first. 
the wall was replaced by the active uh, pressure uh, that was expected to be de resisted by by the wall. So when we reconstructed the failure, or we came up with a failure mechanism, uh, this is what we th what what I think happened. Uh, first one that you had infiltration. Uh, rainfall, incident rainfall, but also infiltration from the pond, also runoff from the ranch road. <clears throat> the water accumulating in the lower portion, uh, in particular because of the dam effect created by the Vista del Rincon wall. The uh, consistent with what witnesses observed, the wall started to move due to the increased pressures uh, from the wall, hydrostatic pressures too. <clears throat> the, uh, uh, the lower slope started to fail, and uh, because the wall was located there, a bulge started to form in the lower portion of the slope. So once the lower portion had moved, uh, it withdrew support from the upper portion of the slope here in yellow, which was a, a more sandier type of material. And this one, as it came down, started overriding on the lower wall. And when it hit uh, the bulge, it uh, diverted uh, towards the left. So what are some of the lessons that we, 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 we can uh, learn from this case history? Uh, in terms of uh, the ranch, uh, it's very clear that the ranch should not have created an online channel through the middle of the landslide that allowed for infiltration uh, uh, into the 1995 landslide deposits. Things that the ranch could have done on a regular basis would be, for example, fine grading to fill the cracks that, that would form as the landslide moved, uh, build impermeable surface uh, drainage devices, for example, line the pond, uh, line the channels uh, with uh, a material that would not permit infiltration, just synthetic, uh, plastic, something like that. Uh, but also they could have done uh, dewatering, for example, install hydro uh, throughout the 1995 landslide. From the position of the county, uh, uh, the wall along Vista del Rincon should not have been built without uh, adequate drainage. Okay. Uh, also, it should not have been uh, built as a temporary and, and, and be left there for uh, five plus years. In fact, they had no uh, plans to actually ever uh, re or replace it w uh, during, during that period, 2000 to 2005. Also, a wall at the toe of a landslide is not going to have active pressure, so they should have designed for much higher earth pressures. And the two consultants who actually acted as reviewers had uh, various safety concerns, and this should not have been ignored. So uh, in conclusion, uh, we have uh, the 2005 failure, which is uh, largely due to uh, man-made or, 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 or man-influence uh, uh, increase long-term saturation of the slope, uh, which made it a lot more vulnerable uh, to, uh, uh, to a landslide. Uh, we saw that both the analysis as well as the witnesses uh, indicate that the failure started uh, at the toe, at the location of the wall. Uh, in the early stages of the failure, uh, both the wall and the bulge that was created as the lower slope fail uh, was, uh, in, in my opinion, the main reason why the, the debris flow rotated and turned to the left. Uh, and uh, the area where people thought they were safe because uh, they were away from the failure uh, um, then became uh, vulnerable. And so uh, these diverted debris flow ended up bearing an area that appeared relatively safe from mud flows. 
And with that, I'm done with my presentation. Thank you very much, and I'm going to see if there's any questions. Okay, the first question I have is, was any soil treatment considered to limit the expansion of the soil and increase the strength of the in situ soil? And to my knowledge, uh, during the whole period 1995 uh, to 2005, uh, no uh, soil treatment uh, was uh, uh, proposed uh, by the uh, or, or, or even considered by the consultants working for the ranch. And keep in mind that the ranch owned the uh, almost the entire slope. Uh, what was the depth of the desiccation cracking? Uh, in the areas that were of main concern, which is uh, between uh, the pond or between the ranch road and, and, and the base, uh, I didn't see what I would typically consider desiccation cracking. I didn't show it in my slides, but uh, there were a lot of seeps and ponds. Uh, I'm sorry, there were lots of seeps on the slope. The material was, was, was really extremely wet. And uh, if uh, uh, I may go to uh, uh, to one of the s slides over here, let me see if I can do this in a in a in an easy manner. Here it is. It's going to take a little bit to show up. Uh, uh, the area where I spent most of the time looking was the area above the wall up to the pond, and in that area, uh, the slope was extremely wet. Um, the third question I have, could you clarify in which direction the wall tilted out from the top or backwards from the bottom? Uh, the uh, drawings made and the report made by the television crews was that the top moved towards the road. Uh, let me see. Two more questions over here. Uh, Tim, uh, if I'm going over time, you tell me, okay? No, we're, uh, we're okay. Was the main soil type of clay? What was the PI? Was it investigated? Uh, was any other uh, modification, soil modification investigated? Uh, because the fault ran uh, through the middle of the slope, let me see if I can show you, show you that uh, in, 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 in one of the slides. I think I have it. Here we are. Okay. Uh, in this slide, you see where the Red Mountain Fault is. Uh, the Red Mountain Fault uh, to the right, on the right side, the material were more sandy. On the left side, the material were more clay. And uh, so uh, the lower landslide debris uh, were uh, uh, were more clay. The upper landslide debris were more sandy, and that's why in this cross section here we have uh, two different uh, type of strength: one for the Monterey Formation and one for the Peak Formation. Uh, the in terms of uh, PI, uh, we did look at the PI for the uh, uh, lower slope, and all the results are are including the paper. What was the remediation after the 2005 landslide? Uh, uh, to immediately after the 2005 landslide, uh, there was uh, essentially no remediation uh, that was done. Uh, last time I saw, uh, uh, next question is, what are the conditions of the site today? Well, I, have, uh, I moved to Ohio two years ago, but last time I saw it, which was maybe two and a half or three years ago, uh, I, I couldn't see that anything had been done. Uh, FEMA doesn't typically pay for mitigation of the landslide, that's correct. Uh, how come they made an exception for this this site? Well, they didn't pay for the for the mitigation of this landslide. They paid for the reopening of the of the road. Uh, that 
soldier pile and lagging wall, which was designed for active pressures, was not really a landslide remediation. Uh, and so that's how the county was able to, uh, to get money, uh, but it was obviously not a landslide repair. Uh, if a limit equilibrium conducted was uh, if, if a limit equilibrium analysis was conducted, how did the results compare to flag? Uh, they compare very well, and uh, uh, um, I don't just do flag. I always run uh, flag and limit equilibrium method. I remember using Spencer method, and my recollection is that uh, they were they were virtually identical. And with that, I've answered all my questions. Tim, all yours. Great, Daniel. Thanks. Thanks for navigating those questions, and thank the audience for submitting uh, some really good questions. Okay, our next speaker. Let's see if I can get the slide set. Yep. Okay, our, our next speaker <clears throat> is Benod Tawari. Benod is a professor of civil engineering at the California State University at Fullerton, also referred to as uh, Cal State Fullerton. Benod has been at Cal State Fullerton now for 12 years and is conducting research in shear strength and slope stability topics there at Cal State Fullerton. Benod's presentation is titled Settlement of a hydropower dam structure during the magnitude 7.8 2015 Nepal earthquake. Benod, thanks for joining us, and your slide should be ready. Thank you, Tim. Uh, <clears throat> uh, as Tim mentioned, uh, I, uh, I'll be talking uh, about a case study on the settlement of a hydropower dam structure during uh, 2015 uh, Gorkha earthquake. Uh, uh, on top of what uh, Tim uh, mentioned he did, uh, for his generous introduction, I want to add that I was at Virginia Tech uh, when, uh, uh, prior to joining Cal State Fullerton, working with Mike Duncan and Tom Brandon. Uh, so, Benod, uh, can you speak a little louder? Yes, I will. So first, I'd like to thank uh, 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 my co-authors. Somehow the animation is not coming uh, uh, nicely, but bear with me. Uh, so uh, you see, this uh, whole thing was uh, an, uh, an episode uh, for me. Uh, so uh, you know, uh, after the uh, uh, the earthquake, we had uh, a few teams visited the site, um, and uh, we had Upper Tamakosi Hydroelectric Project external review panel of experts uh, deployed by the government of Nepal where, uh, you know, uh, Professor Idris, uh, 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 Dr. Markison, uh, Bill Markison, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Ray Martin, uh, uh, and myself joined uh, a, a team of experts uh, under the chairmanship of uh, Professor Jim Mitchell. And prior to that, uh, you see, when uh, I was, uh, I and our, our team was deployed by GEAR, uh, for uh, the geotechnical extreme event reconnaissance of the 2015 Gorka earthquake, uh, you know my uh, uh, you know colleague uh, uh, from the team, uh, Professor Yusuf Hassas, uh, and another team member, uh, Dr. Manjur Palivan, we actually visited the site and recommended to have external review uh, panel. So I thank uh, uh, both uh, Yusuf and Manjur for uh, for uh, their help to accompany me in the site. Uh, and also, uh, you see, we had Upper Tamakosi Hydroelectric Power officials, the project director, uh, Began Shrista, Pradeep Thike, Mohan Gautam, uh, Abhimal Gurung, uh, Raza Silpakar, and so many other officials who actually gave, up, uh, gave us access to the site, uh, as well as uh, the, the pertinent document for us to uh, move forward with. Uh, and uh, last but not the least, I would like to um, thank my uh, Cal State Fullerton colleagues, uh, uh, Dr. Bina Azmera, uh, and my uh, grad student, uh, Vivek uh, Timbadia, uh, who uh, actually uh, did few analysis uh, for, for uh, this project. Uh, so uh, 
the today's presentation sequence would be uh, like first I'll start with the history and background of the hydroelectric project, and then I'll be talking about uh, the uh, 2015 Gorkha earthquake and what happened during that time in this particular project uh, and the seismic effects on the project. Um, and I'll talk about field investigation we made uh, and the settlement calculation we did uh, based on the data we had, uh, and then I'll summarize uh, at the end. Uh, so uh, a little bit about the uh, the project. Uh, this hydropower project is a peaking run off river project uh, with the maximum output of 456 megawatt uh, and 2,281 gigawatt hour of energy. Uh, the the gross head uh, for the project was 822 meters, uh, and the peak discharge from the river was. Uh, uh, design discharge was 66 uh, cubic, um, and the design flood was, uh, you know, uh, 885 uh, cubic. Uh, it was uh, the, a diversion river, river uh, dam project, and the total length of the dam was 60 meter is 60 meter, and the height of the dam is uh, uh, 22 meter. So uh, the live storage was 1.2 million uh, cubic meter cube, and they have two settling basin that I'll be showing you in picture uh, of 225 meter length uh, before the water goes into the uh, uh, the intake uh, tunnel. Uh, the, the headrest tunnel was 8.4 kilometer long with a cross-sectional area of 32.14 meter square uh, and the pen stock was uh, about 1,134 meter uh, long. The, uh, the initial estimated cost, which exceeded significantly because of a few reasons, uh, initial estimate was 441 million U.S. dollar, uh, and initial completion period was six years. That also uh, extended because of the earthquake. Uh, and one thing I have to add here is this is one among the uh, uh, the uh, national uh, you know pride project where the country developed uh, and, uh, this, uh, and developed the hydroelectric project by uh, its own main power. So the project is, uh, you know, this is a map of Nepal, uh, and I'm not going into those uh, earthquake details, because I'll have uh, uh, those details afterwards. The project is uh, pretty close to Chinese border, uh, and it is, if you look in those pink, uh, uh, you know, uh, the pink, uh, 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 in a zone in the map, the lower side of the pink zone is one among the uh, the, the more, uh, active faults. Uh, it is called main central th thrust. So the landslide is uh, 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 the landslide is pretty uh, mm, uh, the the the, uh, the site is pretty close to uh, the active fault uh, region. So if we look into the uh, the topographic information of the uh, the site. Uh, you see, uh, uh, on the right, uh, uh, on the, the top right uh, corner, you can see a dam site, and from that dam site, uh, you see, you, uh, I'm, I'm focusing on the, on the map first, and there is um, a culvert structure going from intake, and then that culvert, uh, you know, connects with the settling basin, and right at the bottom of the settling basin, there is uh, an intake of the tunnel for the water to, uh, to, uh, to uh, go to the penstock. So right uh, top corner, there is a picture where on the left side, it is a picture taken from uh, the, uh, the upstream towards downstream. So left side, it is during construction. Left side is a dam. You can see lower structure, there's a dam. And then on the right of the dam, there is an intake structure where water is uh, passing uh, from that intake structure to uh, uh, the, uh, the culvert and then desilting, uh, desilting basin. And on the right of that intake, uh, you can see uh, the abutment wall. So, and if the lower right corner of that picture is uh, uh, the the picture of the, uh, the the site before they initiated construction in 2012, and on the left side of that picture you can see a tiny uh, the landslide type of structure. That is actually uh, the uh, the left uh, uh, the right bank. Uh, uh, right abutment bank, uh, abutment wall of the, uh, the the dam itself. So if we go into picture in more, uh, you know, in detail, this the, is the, on 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 the left side. When the dam was designed, it was designed for the 500-year return period uh, uh, 
uh, ground acceleration of 0.35 Z, and uh, the design acceleration was um, 2,000 year. It was 0.51 Z. Uh, that was uh, uh, what we got from the design report. And in 2012, when the dam was constructed, it started from the right uh, abutment wall. You can see um, uh, in the left uh, picture. And first, uh, the uh, sheet uh, piles were uh, constructed. And after that, uh, the dam was uh, uh, started being built from the right side, starting from the uh, uh, from the uh, the <coughs> abutment. And the right side picture you can see is when the dam construction progressed. And the dam uh, kept on progressing. This is uh, on the left uh, top picture uh, was uh, uh, taken uh, during the construction period. It is on the, uh, uh, it is from uh, up, downstream, it is facing from downstream towards upstream. Uh, and uh, the right, uh, uh, the top right picture is during the, uh, in 2013 after the construction initiated. It is also facing from downstream uh, towards upstream. And then the, the bottom left also shows the progress of the, uh, the dam construction, and the bottom right was right after uh, the earthquake. So when uh, uh, the earthquake happened in 2015, uh, then the dam was still under construction, but there, there was significant settlement that I, I'll be talking about in a few uh, minutes. So uh, left uh, picture is uh, the Google Earth picture, so uh, please pay attention to this. The, the bottom of that uh, picture, you can see uh, the nice landslide dam created. That dam was created a few, uh, four or 500 years ago, uh, and uh, then that had a nice settlement uh, in the area for a long period, and the height of the dam was about 500 meters. So that gave a nice head for the hydroelectric project, uh, and the dam was, uh, you see, the, the dam site is almost at the top of, of this left, left picture. And if you look into the right side picture, you can see uh, the aerial view of that uh, dam site, uh, taken the, the picture taken from upstream, uh, uh, facing downstream. So left side, the dam is still under construction. It was after 2015 earthquake. Uh, and then right side, you have the intake structure, and that intake structure is connecting to the, uh, the culvert, and then that is connecting to a uh, two uh, desilting uh, basins, and that the, at the end of the desilting basin, there is a tunnel. So, uh, and then you can also see uh, the side of the wing wall here. And if we look into uh, the uh, the the area, it is uh, almost uh, very very flat, uh, and it is a, a, a landslide dam uh, deposit. So it has been deposited there for uh, almost 500 years. Uh, and if we look into uh, uh, the, uh, the le let's say, the left side of this, uh, uh, and the top left photograph we can see is uh, that uh, sediment, uh, landslide dam sediment, and right side photograph you can see is the actual landslide dam. So from the left, the, dam, the landslide came in, and it blocked the... Uh, 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 it blocked the uh, the river that is Upper Tamakosi River, and the nice uh, you know uh, the pond or lake was created. And uh, this left bottom left uh, uh, photograph you can see is the the section of that landslide dam. Uh, it is hard to see here, but I will tell you it is about uh, 500 meter uh, meter tall landslide dam. And uh, bottom right uh, cross section we have here is created by when we uh, visited the site and uh, the, the panel of experts under the, the chairmanship of uh, Professor Jim Mitchell, uh, we created that profile and we told them, uh, oh no, uh, the, uh, the depth of the bedrock could be between 100 uh, to 130 meters. Until then, the investigation report did not have information about the depth of the bedrock. Uh, that was uh, that actually triggered this investigation, and without without having the depth of bedrock, it was almost impossible to calculate the seismically induced uh, settlement. So, uh, uh, what happened uh, uh, during the earthquake was, you see, uh, 18 December 2014, there was an earthquake during the construction of that dam. There was 5.3 magnitude earthquake occurred 21 kilometer away from the dam site. Uh, and they detected the, de uh, the settlement of uh, the, the dam. You see, the, uh, uh, the wing wall was fine, but there was uniform settlement uh, of the intake and dam structure. That settlement was five centimeter, um, five centimeter. 
and the project started monitoring the settlement for, uh, since that time. And 2015, uh, but 25th April 2015, 7.88 magnitude Gorkha earthquake hit the, the area, and it was the epicenter of the earthquake was 150 kilometers away uh, from the uh, the dam site, and that increased its settlement that triggered 11 centimeter more settlement. And then 12 May uh, uh, 2015, the, that was the largest aftershock of Gorkha earthquake, 7.3. Actually, uh, I was there uh, at the site when we were doing this investigation. Um, and I and, uh, uh, I and, uh, and um, uh, one of our uh, team members, we were visiting uh, 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 Rob Moss from Cal Poly. We were visiting the uh, the epicenter of uh, 7.3 magnitude aftershock, and which is uh, uh, the the pretty close to the uh, the dam uh, dam site. It was 14 kilometers away from the dam site, and that increased the settlement further by uh, three uh, three centimeters. So and that triggered uh, our uh, visit first visit to the site under up, up on the request of the project authority. So uh, uh, when we were we were at the site, there was nine, uh, 19, uh, 18 and a half centimeter settlement already, uh, and the the team uh, the when uh, the uh, the second team that is a team of expert we visited the site uh, we uh, we estimated that the uh, uh, the uh, the calculated median peak ground acceleration at the site uh, for two events could be uh, could range from 0.24 to 0.3 for the main shock and 0.26 to uh, 0.27 for the aftershock. Uh, that was uh, actually calculated by uh, uh, our colleague, uh, Professor Ed Idris. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, the, please pay attention to this picture. Uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the one, uh, the red, uh, the star mark is the epicenter of the main shock. The blue star mark is the epicenter of the aftershock. And the, uh, the, uh, the yellow uh, 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 dot is the project site. So project site is right at the, uh, uh, the rupture surface line. So the Gorkha earthquake uh, uh, triggered, I mean, even though the magnitude was pretty high, the uh, ground acceleration at Kathmandu, which is about um, uh, 60, 70 kilometers away from the site, uh, had 0.16 g of uh, big ground acceleration. Uh, and the aftershock, 7.3 uh, aftershock, had about uh, 0.07 uh, g of big ground acceleration in Kathmandu. Uh, but this big ground acceleration, uh, this uh, earthquake, triggered about 0.24 g of peak ground acceleration at the dam site. Uh, so if we look into the dam site, uh, you see there was a nice, uh, mm, uh, there was a 19 centimeter uniform settlement of the, uh, the, the dam site. So this is a picture uh, taken from downstream toward upstream. So left side, uh, the, uh, the wing wall was fine, but you know all the intake and dam structure settled, you know, uniformly by 19 centimeter uh, throughout the time, and that triggered our first visit there. Uh, you know, in picture, this is in, in the background. You can see that 19, 18 and a half centimeter settlement. In the background, you can see myself uh, here with the yellow jacket and Yusuf uh, uh, with uh, the, the orange uh, uh, vest, and then Menger. Uh, uh, close to uh, Yusuf, so we went there, uh, and then we uh, report. We told them that there should be uh, the external review panel to evaluate the the report because the the investigation they had did not go uh, be, beyond 37, 38 meters. While they they had no idea what was the uh, the depth of uh, the bedrock there and what is the depth of the actual settlement, no debris uh, uh, settlement. And then after that, it triggered uh, two months after uh, our first visit. It triggered uh, the uh, the external review panel visit with, and in the picture you can see project officials uh, and the consultants. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, from the left you can see uh, Bill Markison uh, in the third one from the left, and Ray Martin, uh, uh, the Professor Jim Mitchell, Professor Ed Idris after that, and I'm all the way on the right. Uh, so we went to the site, did a detailed investigation, and looked into the report. We spent 10 days on the site, and. Uh, if you want to see uh, the detail of the settlement, right? You see the entire structure settled by 19 centimeter exactly in the same way. So left side is the closer view, uh, you know, aerial view of the dam site. The left top picture, the right top picture, you can see uh, the nice uh, settlement, uh, uniform settlement of the uh, the intake structure against the uh, the wing wall, and uh, you can see that 19. And then the bottom left picture is 19 centimeter settlement. 
uh, uh, and uh, then the bottom right was uh, the settlement of uh, the picture I took. Uh, we took the bottom left was uh, uh, you know uh, mm, the, our first visit, and bottom right was after our second visit. And all parapet wall also settled uh, uniformly. But if you look into uh, uh, the dam structure now, it is almost complete. Uh, this was uh, taken in uh, two months ago when I was there in the site, uh, and uh, mm, you see. Uh, after uh, the, the, uh, the, our investigation, we requested them to do boring, and they did uh, the boring, I mean, uh, the, the investigation, uh, uh, deep investigation. So they started monitoring the settlement. So first settlement uh, was in 2014. It has five centimeter settlement, and then it was almost, con you know, constant no settlement, and then 2015 World Cup earthquake triggered at 11 centimeter more, and after that it was uh, the aftershock that triggered uh, uh, four uh, centimeter more uh, settlement. Uh, and uh, with our in, uh, in, in a request, uh, there was uh, one borehole uh, located uh, uh, at the downstream side of the dam. They, they had 150, over 150 meter deep borehole, and they found the, the uh, bedrock uh, at uh, around 123, 24 uh, meter depth. And while uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, subsurface explorations was uh, uh, done, uh, the project also conducted um, uh, the SPD, uh, you know, uh, uh, flow counts uh, in the site, and uh, the 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 soil was uh, a different type. There were different type of soils, including gravels, sands, colluviums, and some of them were even, uh, you know, uh, small size cobbles and boulders. Uh, and left side, uh, uh, the data we have y-axis the depth, x-axis SPD flow count uh, in every ten. Uh, uh, count interval, uh, if it's hard for you to see the picture, and then we uh, just uh, divide them into different zones. Uh, it is in borehole number two, which is right below the dam, and the right side, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the diagram, same thing, but borehole number three, which is uh, the left side, a uh, uh, little uh, downstream, maybe 20, uh, 30 meter downstream of the, uh, the dam site. So using those SPD blow counts, uh, we uh, uh, try to calculate. It's, it's so hard uh, to, uh, you know, apply different uh, <laughs> techniques here. It's so hard even to do numerical analysis because uh, the site was not investigated properly. Uh, so uh, what we did was we did settlement calculations just for the sake of rough estimation uh, using uh, the uh, um, the uh, the uh, the first method uh, using a uh, Toki Maxwell and Seed method. Uh, the, we use the relationship to, uh, to estimate the volumetric strain induced by the ground shaking in saturated sands using the cyclic stress ratio, uh, the, you know, proposed by uh, the uh, Sidon Idris 1971, and the SPD blow count with the corrected SPD blow count. Uh, and we also use uh, the method proposed by second method proposed by ECR and uh, the, the 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 issue here is all these methods were, uh, you know, useful. For sands, they were developed for sands, and this, uh, you know, the subsurface exploration <laughs> told us it is not just sand. It has all sort of big size uh, gravels and uh, pebbles and cobbles, but they were, uh, they also had equal potential to settle. And then we also tried. I mean, these are two major methods we used, uh, just simply straightforward uh, uh, equations we put. Uh, and we also tried uh, the uh, the third method that Iwasaki et al. proposed. Uh, uh, for a few experimental uh, data, uh, and we also use the data, uh, the, the method proposed by uh, Nagase and Ishihara. Uh, actually, these are same uh, methods proposed by, uh, you know, uh, the uh, Tokimachu and Seed, uh, but a little more, uh, you know, data-based uh, the, the proposals. Uh, the issue we had was, you see, the big issue for any method we are using, like you can, we can, like, this is a um, simple equation I put for the cyclic strand, but as you know, the settlement calculation is uh, iterative, uh, and, uh, you know, the, the issue we had was the RD, that is depth uh, correction factor for the uh, cyclic stress ratio was so vague, uh, and um, we tried to see how, uh, how much settlement we'll get for the, uh, uh, the depth correction factor, uh, the, the extreme left lower end, or the the, uh, the higher end, uh, and uh, this tells uh, 
the left uh, top corner, that is the settlement we got uh, from uh, different uh, from the first method, it, uh, you know, Tokimatsu and Seed method. That I I personally thought that was uh, uh, that gave the, the best estimate. Uh, and the peak ground acceleration. So the range is the right. Uh, uh, the, the two broken line we have these are the ranges from the lower uh, effective uh, that uh, the uh, the uh, depth correction factor and the the, the right uh, uh, and the higher depth correction factor, and then uh, the solid lines are uh, the estimates we got for the borehole two, uh, and then the, the triangle uh, as you know enclosed by two uh, blue uh, broken lines are uh, the, uh, the the data we we got for different ranges uh, and the average the uh, solid lines uh, are average uh, for uh, mm, uh, with uh, for borehole number 3 so top left was with uh, the tokimatsu and seed uh, top right was uh, the uh, uh, Yosemite and uh, and uh, uh, and ishihara uh, and the bottom uh, c and d are the uh, the two you know the different the other methods i i wrote, method 3 and uh, method 4 uh, and please uh, uh, keep in mind that peak ground acceleration we had, uh, you know, there was no <laughs> no uh, ground motion data available. Only thing we had was the shake map created by uh, USGS, and based on that shake map, the peak ground acceleration was 0.24 z in the area. So for that uh, peak ground acceleration, we calculated the uh, the uh, the settlement uh, in centimeters. So here you can see method one, two, three, four. Uh, and the, then, uh, then you have uh, the minimum RD, that is depth uh, correction factor, maximum depth correction factor, and the average depth correction factor. So uh, with the first method, Tokimatsu and Seed, with the minimum depth factor, the depth correction factor, we got 11 centimeters settlement, uh, and the average 67. And with second method, Ishihara and uh, uh, Yosemite, 21 centimeters settlement, and the average minimum with the minimum uh, the range, and the average of 117 centimeters of settlement. So the actual field settlement with this uh, main shock was only 11 centimeters. So from that, I could see that, you see that all these charts developed uh, uh, for saturated sand uh, may not actually work for the heterogeneous and then larger size uh, uh, you know, uh, deposits. Especially, this is very important. The project authorities didn't have this calculation uh, uh, in the report, and that was giving a uh, havoc to them, saying that, hey, the dam sell by 19 centimeters, and then media, the newspaper, the television channels, all, all of them were showing those information. When we went there, we did the uh, settlement calculation, and, and, and we told them, okay, so the settlements are expected anyway, so we need to have an emergency uh, a plan uh, for the future earthquakes in the area. Uh, that concluded our uh, mission there, but the, the authority started construction, and in the past two years, the construction is done. Uh, hopefully next year, the project will be in operation. And if they will have this in operation, 23% of the, uh, I mean, 67% of the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the energy that the country is buying from outside uh, will be uh, taken care of by uh, this project. So with this, I would like to, uh, uh, you know, conclude uh, with, uh, I would like to summarize uh, what I had here is, you see, the Gorkha earthquake, 2015 Gorkha earthquake caused a significant settlement at the dam site of Upper, uh, upper Tamakusi hydroelectric project in addition to triggering co-seismic landslides. Because I didn't have enough time, I didn't talk about co-seismic landslides here. Even this site has a lot of landslide uh, cases. Uh, and I, I, I would say at least, uh, you know, over 100 landslides triggered by uh, the, uh, the, the earthquake in this dam site, which is more vulnerable than even the settlement um, of, the, of the dam, uh, in fact. So I didn't, uh, di I didn't talk about the landslide, but there were almost 15,000 landslides triggered by this, uh, uh, this earthquake throughout the country. Uh, and the amount of the settlement with uh, the time were recorded, as you saw. It increased with uh, the, the uh, different, uh, you know, episodes of the shaking. However, the actual settlement calculation could not be made due to the lack of ground motion data at that time. Uh, and that actually, I mean, uh, uh, you know, uh, created havoc uh, to the project authority, uh, and that triggered uh, that, uh, in, uh, you know, investigation. So in this study, we uh, we collected the data that the, uh, the, the uh, 
the subsoil exploration and SPD blow count data. And then we did very simple uh, the settlement calculus and that our grad student can run uh, to, to check, uh, you know, whether our rough calculus will, uh, will match with, with verify uh, the actual field situation. So we're using various uh, methods that we have, and I, uh, I want to focus more on method one and two, that, that is talking match and seed and uh, the, the uh, ESMN and ECR and ESMN method. And then we try to, you know, similar that, we try to verify the actual settlement and the, those methods for the actual settlement in that area that has heterogeneous, uh, you know, type of uh, sediment. So based on the settlement calculation for each event, I mean, there are, uh, one method seemed to be more appro appropriate than the other, but those formula we were using and those uh, the em empirical uh, you know data charts we were using were developed for assessors. And so uh, I, this triggers uh, you know uh, the potential or the possibility for us or a requirement for us to have uh, uh, you know more rigorous investigation for uh, you know uh, the, for the settlement calculation. Uh, of uh, the, 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 these dam sites, these type of dam sites where we have landslide uh, sediment, uh, dams are, uh, you know, floating dam constructed on landslide sediment to get the advantage of those, uh, you know, head. So with this, I would like to conclude my uh, uh, presentation. If you have, a, uh, if uh, uh, you have any question, I'll take them. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thanks. Yep, thank, thank you, Vinod, for an interesting case history. Uh, right now, I don't see any questions posed. Let's see, let me hit refresh. Oh, here's one. Um, what sort of additional investigation would you need to perform the settlement calculation? For example, ground motion data, borings, et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. Ground motion data is, uh, you know, in our report, we recommended them to have uh, the ground motion data. So th there's no way we can go back and, uh, uh, you know, do investigate for this. There was uh, the no ground motion data in the site, but now they have established, uh, uh, you know, ground motion station there for a local project. Uh, and this area is a high uh, seismic, uh, seismically active area. So. Uh, because the the, the subsurface sub profile is already there now, uh, and uh, if the ground motion station is established there, uh, you know, uh, and then the settlement calculus is uh, they are continuously doing this settlement uh, uh, investigation since uh, 2014 December. Uh, the future ground motion, uh, uh, you know, data and the future, uh, you know, settlement would definitely help us. Uh, uh, to make sure that you know uh, the, uh, the the chart that we developed uh, 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 and the future modification of the chart will help us to estimate the uh, seismically in settlement in floating dam structures. Okay, one uh, one last question, and then we'll have to move on. What percentage would you attribute to the site conditions versus the seismic event? Yeah, it's, it's very tough uh, to uh, break them into uh, the, uh, the 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 percentage, but I think it is uh, uh, I think it is half half because site condition is uh, important because it's loose sediment, and at the same time you have uh, the site uh, the seismic event. So if the settlement uh, would have been just static due to uh, the dam structure, then they would detect those settlement even before the seismic event. So definitely it is um, it is half half. So seismic event and the the loose uh, sediment we have in the site. Okay, uh, let's see. Yep, that's great. Okay, Benoit, uh, thank you very much for an interesting presentation. Okay, moving to our last presentation. Yep, which is uh, myself. I'm Tim Stark, a professor of civil engineering at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. The title of my presentation is MSE Wall Failure and Lessons Learned. The outline for my presentation is shown on this slide. I'll cover some of the subsurface conditions, most importantly, the observed movements 
and then look at the analyses we perform to try to determine the cause of the movement of the MSE wall. Here is aerial view of the wall. The east wall is on the right, the west wall is on the left, and it's the west wall we will focus in on. Here's a ground level view of the east and west walls. On the left is the east wall. The east wall performed well. It's nine feet lower than the west wall, which helped. The embankment's also three feet lower. And there was also less soft clay or a thinner soft clay deposit underneath the east side versus the west side. <clears throat> the photo on the right is the west side. Um, just during uh, the investigation. An important piece of the puzzle is the construction procedure for the MSC wall. On the left in the next three slides is what the contract required for the construction. And on the right in the next three slides is the actual construction procedure. So. At this stage, they're about the same. The rammed aggregate piers that supported the MSC structure are both in place, and open corrugated metal pipes are placed. These are sort of like open cans, so the piles could be slid through the MSC structure and then driven into the subsurface. So at this point, the two construction procedures are the same. Now, the contract required the construction of the MSC portion of the project, as you see on the left. The piles were not to be driven at that particular time. During construction, though, the piles were driven first, and then the MSC wall constructed. That meant that there was a delay in backfilling after the piles were driven of 26 days, and you'll see that in terms of the settlement data that was generated as part of this project. So in other words, if the contract would have been followed, the settlement due to the MSE structure would, some of it would have occurred prior to driving the H piles for supporting the bridge abutment. And here is the final slide illustrating the contract and actual construction procedures. Now you can see the MSC structures in place in both phases and the piles have been driven on the contract required sequence and the MSC wall has been constructed on the actual sequence. So now they're the same, but the pile driving was different. Okay, so subsurface conditions under the west side. This is a busy cross section showing the approach fill in the TAN, the MSE structure with the horizontal reinforcement, the piles driven or placed through it, and the rammed aggregate piers underneath the MSE structure. The subsurface condition uh, consists of a soft clay, and on the left there are some undrained shear strengths ranging from 1,200 near the top to 700 near the bottom of the upper soft clay layer. Underneath the yellow soft clay layer is a sand with a friction angle of 30 degrees, a drain friction angle. And underneath the sand is a glacial till with the green hatch that was competent, is competent material. The piles were driven into this glacial till to support the MSC or I'm sorry, the bridge abutment. Um, okay. The site consists of oops, a old oxbow lake. So the west side, and that's the green circle in this diagram, the west side was predominantly placed over a, an old oxbow lake deposit. And that deposit, of course, had a soft clay layer associated with it, as you saw. And the east side was just off the edge 
of the Oxbow Lake, and there's a, a thinner deposit of soft clay. So observe movements. The west wall was constructed. It reached an elevation of approximately 1,999.6 feet. And the fill uh, stopped and was held there. Now, I mentioned the contract piles were driven 26 days, would have been driven 26 days later if the contract was followed. and the settlement of 12.4 inches, then 6.8 of that would have occurred before the piles were driven. But because the piles were driven first before the MSC structure, the driven piles experienced 12.4 inches or about 1.03 feet of settlement. And that's what's shown by the blue line on this graph. And that's why the 26-day difference is important. If the piles were not driven before the MSE wall. It's possible that they still would have been operational and functional with subject being subjected to only 5.6 inches of settlement. And here's that same graph sort of flipped over. And again, if the MSE wall was placed uh, before the piles, the contract required a settlement of less than or equal to three inches, and the piles could have uh, been at that point when they were driven, if they would have been driven according to the construction contract. Okay. So here's the picture of the wall after construction was halted. The wall looked in good shape. Even though it had undergone considerable movement, there was no damage to the facing panels uh, along the face of the wall, as you can see in these photographs. And you can see the H pile sticking above the top of the MSE wall on the photograph in the right. And here's a look from the other side of the wall. The sand backfills in place. And the wall still looked pretty straight, a little bit of a bow, as you see on the left photograph. There are two slope inclinometers installed in front of the wall as part of the investigation after construction was halted. And I will show you results of those inclinometers in just a minute. Here is a photograph from the top of the wall of the H piles. And this is what really generated the interest in the behavior of the wall, because if you look at the H piles, notice the H piles have been pushed all the way to the front of the can or the corrugated metal pipes along the front row. There are two rows of piles. So you can see the front row in the left photograph sticking above the MSE wall. And there's a back row that you can see on the right photograph just behind this front row in the left. And all the piles in the front row were pushed forward to the front of these corrugated metal pipes that were basically protecting the pile or encasing it through the MSE wall. So that's what triggered the in investigation and the analysis that you'll see in just a minute. Here is some of the lateral movement data that was measured afterwards. The wall at the midpoint, at the highest point, moved approximately 18 inches or 1.4 feet, as you see in the middle red dashed circle. And you can see left and right of the middle, it goes from about 0.9 feet to about one, a little more than one foot. So 18 inches is the lateral movement. And that was based on a survey before and after. There's the wall after construction was halted. And you can see the front and back rows of the H piles. The remedial measure for this project was unfortunately removing the entire MSE wall and piles and reconstructing it. And based on 
um, in this investigation and the cause of movement. So settlement-induced lateral movement. So there were initially two proposed causes of the lateral movement of 18 inches. The first is a settlement, a vertical settlement induced lateral movement. When consolidation settlement occurs, there is a lateral component to that. And so that was the first mechanism that was investigated. The second is a deep seated movement underneath the rammed aggregate piers or through the rammed aggregate piers and moving the entire MSE structure towards the east wall. So here's the settlement-induced lateral movement analysis. And this is some diagrams from Suzuki's at Suzuki 1988 test fill. And when there is vertical settlement on the diagram on the left, the fill was placed, you can see vertical settlement contours underneath the embankment. There is a lateral component, as you see to the right, and that lateral component is associated with squeezing or undrained immediate settlement of the fill at the toe. And the right diagram shows that effect with time. You can see the fill increasing with time and the vertical settlement increasing as well as the lateral settlement. The most important thing to notice about the right diagram is that the vertical settlement is significantly greater than the lateral movement. So vertical settlement on the order of 100 centimeters and the lateral displacement is only about 20 centimeters or a little less, maybe towards 15. So significantly less lateral movement associated with vertical settlement. So, Kavanaugh et al., 1979, and my colleague, Professor Mesri, Reza Mesri at the University of Illinois et al., 1994, came up with some expressions for calculating the lateral induced movement from consolidation of a fill. So, Kavanaugh et al. show that the lateral flow is about 8% of the vertical consolidation settlement, so 8% times S sub C. As you see on the left side, if you take the settlement of 12.4 inches that I showed earlier, multiply it by 8%, you get a lateral flow of about one inch. Mesri et al. 94 show that the maximum amount, and the maximum is associated with this profile of lateral displacement in the upper left figure, that maximum point is about two times the lateral flow predicted by Tavanaugh at all. So even if you use the maximum lateral movement for this vertical settlement, you would multiply approximately one inch by two, and then that maximum lateral movement would be two inches. That clearly didn't explain the measured 18 inches of lateral movement for this west wall. So that left some questions. We tried to back figure it the, or perform an inverse analysis. The maximum lateral movement is 18 inches. So you can rework the Mesri et al. 94 and Tavanaugh et al. 1979 to figure out how much vertical settlement would correspond to a lateral movement of 18 inches. So I reworked the equations on the prior slide and so if I take one half of 18 inches, I get nine. And then if I bring that down to Tavanaugh's 8% from the prior slide, I divide nine inches by 8%. That gives me about 112 inches or 9.4 feet. So that means the MSC fill would have had to settle over nine feet, 9.4 feet, to give a lateral, maximum lateral movement of 18 inches. That clearly is, didn't happen. That's a significant amount of settlement. The wall height at the time of stoppage was 32 feet. So that was, would be almost a third of the height of the wall. 
And so that didn't occur. And so we started looking for another explanation for the lateral movement observed for the West Wall. And that brought us to a deep-seated movement. Here's the cross-section after construction. The approach embankment had a height of approximately 44 feet. There was a little drop between the near finished height of the approach embankment and the top of the MSC wall. You can see the approach embankment's 42 feet. The top of the MSC fill is approximately 32 feet. That would have been brought up to be in agreement with the 44 feet if everything had gone well, but it did not. And so the MSC wall backfill at the time construction was stopped was about 12 feet lower than the approach fill. Okay, so I mentioned inclinometers were installed. There are three important in inclinometers. These were installed after the wall was rejected, and so 10 inches of the 12 inches, uh, 0.4 inches of settlement had already occurred, and also the fill height remained constant after the installation of the inclinometer. So there's limited movement in the inclinometers because of when they were installed. Inclinometer one and two were installed out in front of the wall, and I showed you photographs of those inclinometers out in front of the facing panels. And then there was one more inclinometer, I3, which was placed behind the MSC wall fill in the approach embankment material. And that's very important, which you'll see in a minute. So here is the typical inclinometer signature for SI1 out in front of the wall. You can see the movement is towards the east or uh, away from the backfill. There is movement at a depth of approximately 20 feet. You can see the last signature on the inclinometers. Is, there's a bump at 20 feet and also uh, a bump or a displacement at a depth of 37 feet on the A axis, and the B axis, of course, is perpendicular to the A axis. Here is inclinometer two, also in front of the wall, and it shows essentially the same depth of movement, about 20 and 37 feet, and also the same rate of movement as SI1, which makes sense because both SI1 and two are out in front of the MSC wall. Now, here is SI3, which is in the approach embankment. And there's a photograph of the inclinometer in the approach embankment. So past the inclinometer out in front, you can see maybe a part. That's where the MSC wall is located. There's the same rate as SI1 and SI2, but there's a much deeper depth of movement. So there's a movement at about 59 to 60 feet, way at the bottom, versus 37 feet for the SI1 and SI2. Here's the diagram, a plan view, showing you the three inclinometers again. And one other piece of information to factor into the Inclinometer data is the dashed red line behind the inclinometer is an area where some surface cracking was observed. And the next slide shows you the surface cracking. Yep, here's the ground surface. Um, there's some cracks. If you look at the middle photograph running right across the, the middle of the photograph in the upper left, you can see some cracks which turned out to be tension cracks developing in the approach embankment. Fairly small offset in the cracks, but across the approach embankment. Now, one other way you can plot slope inclinometer data is by using incremental displacements instead of cumulative displacements. The inclinometer plots I showed you previously are cumulative displacements, 
and they sort of mask the depth of movement. When you plot it as an incremental displacement, the depths of movement are accentuated. So here's SI1 out in front of the wall, and this is detailed in a paper you can see referenced in the up, upper left. You can see a distinct movement at about 19 to 20 feet, as I mentioned earlier, and also 36, 37 feet. And you can get more specific with the depth when you plot it in terms of incremental displacements. So that's SI1. Here's SI2, also about 19 and 36 feet. And the real interesting aspect is SI3, which was in the approach embankment. And you can see there's no other movement on, that, on SI3, only at a depth of 59 feet, as you see by the red arrow on the A-axis on the incremental displacement graph. So taking the inclinometer data and checking it with other evidence of deep-seated movement, as part of the remedial measure, all of the H piles were withdrawn or extracted from the subsurface through those metal cans. And notice that some of the extracted piles had bends in them. If you look, for example, on the right photograph, you can see a distinct bend shortly above the tip. In the middle photograph, look at the middle H pile, and it has a bend in it, as well as the lower left photograph. So a number of the piles had depths, bends at depths that were in agreement with movement occurring below the rammed aggregate piers. Another piece of evidence to sort of point towards a deep-seated movement, this is the approach fill before starting construction of the rammed aggregate piers and the MSE wall for the west wall. You can see a fairly steep and high embankment, and the ram rig to construct the rammed aggregate piers is in the left photograph, uh, getting ready to start a rammed aggregate pier. There are pink flags along the toe of that approach embankment that indicate the locations of each uh, rammed aggregate pier. Same with on the right photo. Finally, another, the last piece of evidence that would support deep-seated movement is the contractor's stockpiled soil on top of the approach embankment. So the load or fill was actually higher than 44 feet, certainly for a limited amount of time on the approach embankment. So using all that data, we investigated deep-seated movement to try to investigate whether the lateral movement was due to lateral bulging. There was a slide block that went out to SI3, or there was a second block behind SI3. What actually was occurring and causing the lateral movement of the wall? So if I go back to the cross-section I showed earlier, the dashed red line connects the evidence we had of deep-seated movement. So some tension cracks at the top of the approach embankment, the movement through SI3 at a depth of 59 feet, the bends in the driven H piles in the back row and the front row, and movement in the inclinometers in the front of the wall. Those were really our best pieces of evidence. And then you can see the dashed red line goes up to the ground surface. I didn't find a toe, a well-defined toe out in front. There was a little creek or ditch out in front, so extended the dashed red line up to that point. But there really wasn't a good bulge or toe feature. So the best evidence is the tension cracks, the slope inclinometer data, and the bent H piles. So that brings us to my stability analysis for the West Wall. We used the program SLIDE. It's a two-dimensional limit equilibrium program uh, produced by Rock Science. And that in that program, we used the Morgan Stern and Price stability method. 
In this analysis, we extended the failure surface back to the tension cracks further back on the approach embankment, brought the slip surface through SI3 at 59 feet and the inclinometers out in front of the wall and into the ditch you see out on the right of the cross section. The various soil layers are shown in this slide profile, as well as the rammed aggregate piers and the MSE wall structure. Here are is the computed factors of safety, where we could look at the effect of the embankment height versus the MSE fill investigation. So if I back up one slide, so the orange area is the approach fill and the yellow area with MSE written in it. Now you could, the next slide gives you the effect of raising the MSE fill versus raising the approach embankment to see which had a bigger effect on the factor of safety for a deep-seated slope movement. So the green part, you can see the factor of safety starts very high as the approach embankment is, starts at about 979 elevation. And then as it progresses up to approximately 1,000, remember it stopped about 909.6 feet, you can see the factor safety drops from 4 down to below 1.5. And then if it continues to the proposed fill height of about 1,010, the factor safety appro approaches unity. Conversely, the right half of the graph is the effect of the MSC fill elevation as the approach fill is brought up. And you can see the MSC fill had very little effect on the factor safety, and that's because it's near the base of the slip surface. In fact, more MSC fill increased the normal stress on the slip surface instead of adding driving force. And thus, you can see that the change in factor of safety due to the MSV fill is less than 1%. And so we gave a percentage of about 99% of the change in factor of safety due to the approach embankment from this limit equilibrium analysis. Okay, that brings me to a summary and some quick lessons. Install foundation reinforcement to a firm layer before filling, and that could have potentially helped the overall global factor of safety by extending the rammed aggregate piers into the glacial till. Install, install instrumentation to monitor movements during filling. The contract required piezometers and settlement plates, but they weren't installed. They were installed only after a problem was detected. Changes in construction can cause movements to develop, and if there is a change from the contract construction sequence, that should be investigated. Settlement-induced lateral displacements are only about 8% of the vertical displacement. So it's fairly small um, lateral component. So the cause of lateral movement, we attribute it to deep-seated shearing, and stockpiles and steep interim slopes should, were not considered in this case and clearly, if they are going to be used, soil stockpiles and steep interim slopes, they should be investigated. Would like to thank my co-authors for this presentation, Professor Dick Handy at Iowa State University and Mike Lustig, who's now an adjunct professor also at Iowa State University. So that brings us to the end of our web conference. I want to thank our sponsors for supporting the first EDS web conference. And first is our gold sponsor, Keller. And I want to go back to the sponsor acknowledgement from the beginning. The connected companies of Keller in North America are uniquely positioned to handle the most complex geotechnical construction projects nationwide. By including all services in one contract, Keller reduces client risk and ensures all projects, aspects of a project are met on time and on budget. 
I'd also like to acknowledge our second sponsor, and that's Rock Science. And Rock Science is based in Toronto, and Rock Science is a world leader in developing 2D and 3D software for civil mining and geotechnical engineers. For over 20 years, Rock Science has been at the leading edge of research to build geotechnical tools used by over 7,000 engineers around the world for slope stability, excavation, design, and geotechnical analyses. We thank them for their support. Next, I'd like to quickly thank our speakers. Gotta covered Louisville Dam. Daniel Burdell talked about La Conchita landslide and Benoit Tawari talked about settlement, both static and seismically induced at a hydropower plant uh, dam in Nepal. Finally, I'd like to thank all of you for attending the 2018 Embankment Dams and Slopes web conference. If you have any additional questions, please contact the presenters, the other presenters, or you can send the questions to me and I will forward them on to the other presenters. I have a few questions that were asked during my presentation that I'll try to answer here. Um, in, in a few minutes, there's probably 10 or so questions and we're over time, so let me just pick um, a couple. Here's one, where were the tension cracks noted in relation to the movement? The tension cracks were behind the inclinometer on the approach embankment. So that's why the slip surface extended past the SI3 on the approach embankment. Um, here's another question. How is drainage design done for the soils behind the MSC wall? The MSC wall backfill was a medium, sand, medium to coarse sand, and so it was determined to be a free draining backfill and the reinforcement was uh, metal strips. Was it difficult to remove the piles once installed? The contractor didn't have difficulty pulling the piles. There was a vibratory attachment to the top of the H piles and they were basically vibrated out of place. Remember there was a open corrugated metal pipe that the piles were sitting in through the MSE wall fill so the piles only had to be vibrated out of the subsurface materials. Um, that should mitigate the deep-seated slide in the reconstruction. The reconstruction involved a load transfer platform and the columns that were supporting the load transfer platform were extended into the glacial till underneath, and the fill placement was controlled, and also the approach embankment now had been in place for over a year, actually it's over two years, and so the consolidation, some consolidation happened under the approach embankment, which increased the strength of the material. Uh, let's see. Do you know why the piles were installed first? Doesn't it make compaction of the sand backfill more challenging? Um, I forget the reason why they were installed first. It, it, the piles didn't really matter because remember they were encased in a open corrugated metal pipe. So really it just involved compacting around the corrugated metal pipes in which the piles were installed. Uh, I don't remember. I think it was because the contractor could have the pile driving rig at a low elevation and then just drove the piles. Okay. I think those are the highlight questions. Again, I thank everyone for attending. And if you have additional questions, please email the presenters or send them to me and I will forward them on. Thank you for attending the 2018 Embankment Dams and Slopes web conference.